Thank you so much, Sarah, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to draw together some of the threads of what Osama and China have been telling us about what's been happening in Yemen and in Turkey and offer some reflections on UK arms export policy. So the UK government claims repeatedly, some might say ad nauseum, to have one of the most robust arms export control regimes in the world. A control regime that is based on risk assessment and the prevention of human rights and international humanitarian law violations. However, we continuously and repeatedly see controversies and the agreeing of deals and the granting of licenses that contravene those criteria, as has been explained to us, some of the examples given to us by Osama and by Chinar. And so the question that leaves me with is, how come? How come when we have such a policy that on paper is very clear, we have these repeated controversies? And what are we to make of these controversy about the meaning of UK arms export policy and the character of UK foreign policy? So in this short talk, I'm going to talk a bit about how it is that we've ended up in this situation and then offer two reflections on, on what to make of it in terms of drivers and responses. And this is based um, quite a lot on the research that I've been doing over the past five or six years into arms exports to the Saudi-led coalition and their involvement in the war in Yemen. But I think the lessons are generalizable. The war in Yemen is merely the worst case um, on, on, a, on a rather long list of, of terrible cases. So how is it that the government continues to issue licenses that seem to fly in the face of its publicly stated policy? What we've seen from the war in Yemen is the systematic refusal to know, failure to know about international humanitarian law violations. The Ministry of Defense is only able to track a very small percentage of airstrikes conducted by the Saudi-led coalition and have admitted that they could identify a military target in only about a third of cases. And up until Campaign Against Arms Trade took them to court, the government was not assessing whether there was a pattern to any past violations. And when Campaign Against Arms Trade won their legal case against the government, the Court of Appeal forced the government to go back and retake those decisions to assess whether there was a past pattern. And the government uh, did its review. And as, as Osama pointed out to us, came up with the conclusion that these violations were only isolated incidents. And therefore any past, uh, past previous airstrikes were not evidence of the future risks posed by arms export licenses. So the government seems to be claiming that as long as it can say that it does not know that there have definitely been violations of international humanitarian law, then there is no risk or no clear risk that there might be. But just to give you the precise wording of the government's policy, it's that it will not issue arms export licenses where there is a clear risk that they might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. So it's based on risk prevention, which is supposed to pre prevent catastrophic harm. And these claims to not know about patterns of violations in places like Yemen are backed up when the controversy becomes too much. So there have been incidents that have become too public, too controversial for the government, both the UK government and the Saudi government to ignore. And so when those cases have become, um, have, have threatened to become too controversial, the government, both the UK and the Saudi governments claim that any mistakes were unintentional. And then we see a series of practices of reputation management, also known as whitewashing, 
um, to exonerate the Saudi military forces from the supposed mistakes that they may have made, which is akin to the, um, the type of argument that we often see about a few bad apples, that there is no systematic problem here, it is only isolated incidents. And I think in the case of the war in Yemen, that claim is simply unsustainable. The UK government claims to have a close relationship with the Saudi government and claims to be able to exercise leverage. But we've seen that the UK has not been able to rein in the behavior of the Saudi-led coalition in the war in Yemen. So what we see as an end result in terms of UK arms export policy is that instead of being preventive, risk assessment actually ends up facilitating harm because arms exports to the Saudi coalition have um, increased massively over the duration of the war in Yemen. So with that snapshot of UK policy, what are we to make of it? How are we to understand it? I want to say a couple of things, one about drivers and one about responses. So in terms of drivers of policy, it's, it's often tempting for us as people who are politically interested uh, in UK arms export, arms export policy to frame it as um, a problem of the influence that the arms industry has on government. But I want to argue that it's only partly about corporate profit. Don't get me wrong, it is partly about corporate profit. BAE Systems has made over 15 billion pounds in revenue since the war in Yemen began. But the UK arms relationship with Saudi Arabia is a government to government agreement in which the state and arms companies work together. BAE Systems is the prime contract, what's called a prime contractor. It's, it works on behalf of the Ministry of Defense to fulfill this agreement. And one key effect of this relationship is mutual deniability. So the government can refuse to release information about BAE Systems on the grounds of commercial confidentiality. And when BAE Systems has questions about its activities, it says it operates within the bounds of the law and of UK policy. And we see these patterns in operation, even when we look at the UK's arms relationships with other states where the arms relationships are not necessarily agreed under government to government deals. So in my view, even if arms companies were owned by the state, even if they were nationalized, they would still have a tap on the state's defense budget unless the state decided to turn that tap off. So I think we need to think beyond the narrow idea of government simply being at the service of individual companies and think more about the way in which arms exports are part of a wider system in which the UK state tries to maintain a strategic role in parts of the world such as the Middle East, both in terms of British military and economic power and maintaining relations um, with Gulf regimes and other regimes that it wants to um, maintain good relations with. If you're interested in this topic, David Wearing has a fabulous book called Anglo Arabia that sets out a lot of this in more detail. So that's a word about some of the drivers. I think we need to think about what the government is doing and what the state is doing as much as what the arms companies are doing and pay attention to the ways in which those, um, those interests in, in, inter, interlink. And so thinking then in terms of responses. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the character of the justifications that the UK government offers for its arms exports. And it's always in terms of values, liberal values around tolerance, around support for human rights, support for the rule of law, and so on. And we've heard the term hypocrisy mentioned a couple of times in this panel already. And I think we need to move beyond simple accusations of hypocrisy, because I think the hypocrisy is actually part of the point. Liberal states, those that claim to be interested in and supportive of human rights, 
They offer justifications in terms of human rights and in terms of support for humanitarian law that are actually part of the package of facilitating war crimes. So I think we need to connect up arms exports to overseas states, to British domestic military procurement, to the provisioning of the UK military and the wars that the UK is involved in fighting in. So that this is not simply a problem of what foreign states over there are doing in their wars or in their repression, but what are we doing with our weapons in our wars, in our repression? So connecting up military power to police power. And I think the CAT conference is a really, really good example of how we might start making those connections. And I think the final point that I'll end on is to pick up what Osama said about the importance of accountability, redress and reparations. I think for those of us who are based in the UK, who are UK taxpayers or who are UK citizens who are, or who are the political community on behalf of whom the government claims to speak. I think we, rather than thinking in terms of sympathy or aid, I think we need to think in terms of solidarity. Thank you.